In our lives, we have many voices vying for our attention. They're creeping at different times of our lives, like the need to want more stuff, fulfilling desires we shouldn't, devaluing ourselves, and the voice of woe is me. These voices are fighting for our attention. Are we going to let them? It's good to see people here on Time Change Sunday. Woo woo. Got more energy, more focus, more everything, right? Unless you stayed out till 2 or 3 in the morning and then it doesn't matter at all. All right. Well, I'm glad you're here. We're going to continue our series on voices, as the video just said. Today, I want to talk to you about uh, the voice of sensuality. I'm going to try to be as careful as I can be with this so that uh, uh, I know we have some uh, young people in the room. Uh, I'm not talking about you guys. You need to hear it. In Christianity, we face two opposing values, often raising their head. One is legalism and the other is license. Legalism operates in the arena of salvation. It says to you, you must do to be saved. You must do this, you must do this, you must do this, you must keep this, you must follow this rule, you must do this uh, in order to be redeemed, to be a Christian. Uh, this has been soundly rejected by most of Christianity, thank goodness. Uh, I am saved by grace through faith, that not of myself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Colossians 2, 14 uh, tells us that he took, he canceled the debt against us, nailing it to his cross. So that, there's a ring in this somewhere. Uh, that you have a, a God who took your sin on his body on the cross, canceling the debt that was owed by you uh, because he paid it. And so I am saved today because of what God did, not what I do. That's important for us to understand. So legalism, and uh, people confuse, legalism isn't about how I live my life, it's how I redeem my life. Legalism is the act of being saved by the deeds that you do. And the vast majority of religions in the world are work-based religions. You do something and that's how you obtain uh, your salvation. The only ones who are not that way are Christians. And when I say Christians, I'm talking about born-again children of God not just the denomination in and of itself. Because a large portion of the denomination of Christianity has been seduced into thinking that they can gain favor with God by the way they perform. Can't happen, won't happen. You are saved by grace through faith, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, period. The other is license, and this operates within the arena of the saved. And it says this, it doesn't matter how you live. Once you have come to Christ, what you do in the flesh has no value whatsoever. You don't have to worry about it. Just go do whatever you want to do. And unfortunately, this value, this concept has been endorsed and involved with a large section of Christianity today. I want you to know I do not accept either extreme. Neither legalism nor license. I believe that as a gospel redeemed person, the gospel makes claims on my life that I should live a certain way. Not to gain God's favor, but because I have gained God's favor, I should live a certain way. So I, I, I reject the whole concept of license and I reject the whole concept of legalism. But those who are saved are saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ, the God of the universe moves into our life. 
And if there isn't some evidence of him being in our life, then I think you need to look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself a very serious question. Is God at home in my life or not? Because the God of the universe moves in with the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Word of God, there should be a change happening in our lives. So that's just that. Galatians 5.19 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. Whereas they are not the works of the Spirit. They are the works of the flesh. And they that live in the Spirit should live by the Spirit. And they that live in the flesh will live by the flesh. I want to share with you what I think are the five basic marks of paganism. Go with me. The importance of human form and accomplishment. Uh, you will notice that in pagan nations there is much concentration on the human form and also on human accomplishment, uh, i.e. athletic or military prowess, uh, great artistic ability. All of those things uh, are marks of human form and accomplishment. Number two, bloodthirsty entertainments. They just love bloodthirsty entertainments. They didn't have what we have today where we can pretend to be involved in bloodthirsty entertainments. Uh, they had to do the real thing. And so they had the gladiators would get into a ring and people by the 100,000 or 20,000 or 50,000 would sit around and watch people kill each other. Idolatry, worship of other things, embracement of and enjoyment with sexual perversion. I want to explain that. I'm going to do this again, but I want you to understand what sexual perversion is. From a biblical perspective, sexual perversion is any sex that occurs outside of the marriage relationship of one man and one woman, period. Anything else is sexual perversion. That got you quiet. The embracement of and enjoyment of sexual perversion. The last one is horrific to me is the worst. Increase of violence among the people. Violence on and by children. I saw an ad the other day that said that there, we lose 30,000 people to gun violence in our nation. I want to tell you that the vast majority of those people who, who are killed by gun violence are killed by young people. Killing young people. What we would used to call children are engaging in violence with one another. We are a violent society. We get angry and physical about all kinds of things today that we would have just brushed off and gone on with uh, a few decades ago. If you, these are the marks of Rome, by the way, and all other pagan cultures. If you lay these five things across America, uh, you can see that that's where we're headed in a very fast and rapid way. I used to, when I was a kid, see missionary photos and slides of faraway places where this kind of activity took place. Now I just have to look around. I see them all over my country. Colossians 3, 5 says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. So today I want to talk to you about that ever-present, seductive voice of sensuality that whispers into our life every day. You can hear it at church. I heard a pastor one time when he was preaching was talking about uh, the, per, uh, the perva pervasive use of pornography and, pornography and they, have a, they have a filtering system in their church. We don't. We might have to have to do this. He said every Sunday... They block numerous attempts to get, to get to pornographic sites during worship services. While you're sitting in this room, 
the sweet and seductive voice of sensuality will whisper into your mind. And evil thoughts will come to mind. That's because it never goes away. It's always out there. And it's constantly seducing us to walk in the flesh and to go after the flesh. It, if you can hear it at school. I have a, a connection with a teacher who's also a coach and uh, was talking about the problems he had with his team coaching, uh, keeping them off each other while they're trying to do basketball. In the, la in the bathrooms of many high schools and junior highs, conduct is going on that would shock their parents to the core. This is not something that happens outside of us. It happens to us. And it is universal. You don't get old enough to not have it happen. And by unbelievable things that have happened, you can't be too young anymore to have it happening to you. The definition of sensuality is the state of or the quality of being sensual. Fondness for or indulgence in sensual pleasures, lasciviousness, an old English word, and lewdness. The body or our senses is what sensuality means. And so it, it comes at us from two different ways. Number one, it directs us to live our lives, make our choices based upon how we feel. Now listen to this. How many times a day do you say to yourself about a decision or an incident or something you're evaluating, well, I feel. I feel this. I feel this is right. I feel that's right. I feel this. Whereas as believers, what we're supposed to say, what does the Lord say? What does the word of God say about this? And make our decisions based upon that. I'm going to give you an illustration of, of a guy who made a decision based upon his, sen his senses. His name was Lot. He, had a, he was a very wealthy man, but he was living with his uncle, who was also extremely wealthy. They had many herds and flocks, and so their workers were getting into fights with each other because they're all vying for the same grass, they're all vying for the same water, and they're becoming uh, angry with each other. And so the, the, matri the patriarch, Abraham, says to Lot, hey, you know what, there's too many of us in this one space. You choose left, I'll go right. You choose south, I'll go north. Just choose some place, take it. We're, we're brothers. We're, we be brethren is the way the old King James said it. We're in this together, so let's not have our guys fighting about this. Just choose a different place, and I'll go the other way. So he gave him first choice. Lot looked down on a lush, green, productive valley and thought to himself, man, there is plenty of water there, there's plenty of grass there. My, it, what he did is he made a sensual decision based upon his senses. He said, this is going to be economically beneficial for me if I go there. And so he went there. That lush green valley, if you went there today, there isn't a blade of grass anywhere in it. It was the valley of Sodom and Gomorrah. It cost him his family. And God destroyed that place to such a point that there is not, there's no grass, there's no living anything there. The Dead Sea has nothing living in it either. He made a choice based upon how it felt to be economically advantage, ad, advantageous for him, and it cost him everything. So how does that work for you and me? Well, I get offered a promotion. And so I think about the promotion, and I feel that it would be advantageous for me to take this promotion because I get an X number of dollar rate. I get a title that is very uh, important to me. And I, I, but what happens is you take that job, and I've seen this happen many times, 
in my 40 years of ministry. Take that job and all of a sudden there's a great demand on your time and you no longer can do the things that you were doing for the Lord because you're spending too much time. Or they move you away from everything that you had that was helping you grow and mature in your Christian faith and you're out on your own and you're working all the time. I did it in my own life. I started working every Sunday because of the double time that I was getting. Every holiday I was working and it just destroyed our relationship and nearly cost me everything. You can't make decisions based upon how you feel and expect them to work out great for you every time. Won't do it. As a believer, you can't do that. As a believer, you have got to say, what does God want me to do? And I've known people who have given up promotions because they are, they are content where they are they love doing what they're doing for God. They want to be more used by God. And so they just say no to that advantage. And God blesses them for that choice. Now don't hear what I'm not saying. I wish every Christian in here who regularly gives would get rich. There's nothing wrong with that. Money isn't the issue. But the devil is so sneaky. He is so tricky. He'll come along and promise you everything, and he delivers nothing but trouble and sadness and sorrow. Even the ancients knew that sin only satisfies for a little while. The other part of this in our life is this. It directs us to indulge our lives in carnal activities. The word is pornea, the Greek word. It means fornication, and it covers all sex outside of one man, one woman, in a committed marriage relationship. It's where we get the word pornography from. I know what I'm saying is unpopular. I know that it's, it's rejected by the vast majority of people that I'm looking at, let alone the people that are out there. And you're not alone. Your grandfathers did it. Your grandmothers did it. Your parents did it. It's because it's a pervasive, continuous whisper in our ears that we should fulfill our lust and passions the way we want to. It's what the enemy does. If statistics are true, every one of these people right here that I'm looking at have already been engaged with some level of pornography. They have been acquainted with or at least skimmed across pornography. Isn't that sad? You talk about innocence being taken. And I'm not, you know, my, those of you, how many of you are 20 in here? 20s. You're in your 20s. Raise your hand. You're in your 20s. Raise your hand. Thank you. You can put it on. <clears throat> I say that I say that hand put it up again no our world today is not like our world used to be you don't know this because you have a you have a different frame of reference when I was young and found my dad's magazine in his drawer there are worse things on TV today I don't mean cable I mean on regular TV, then we're in that magazine. I, do you know that they used to have to sell bras on mannequins? They'd have a mannequin, they'd put the bra on the mannequin, and the sales lady would be there saying, this, see the cross your heart bra. Huh? You you remember that, don't you? <laughs> On a mannequin. And then they got really racy. Women would put them on on top of their clothes. And they would do a commercial with a woman wearing her bra on the outside of her clothing. 
yesterday morning or Friday morning or whatever it was on Good Morning America in the middle of time when people would be getting ready to go to school, they had the angels, good name for them, walking on stage We are constantly being eroticized by the enemy. The world has changed significantly. Not only are kids engaging in pornography, in some cases children as young as junior high are producing their own pornography and putting it online. God help us. Things are wrong here, folks. And every parent and grandparent who is here, we are responsible for what is happening because we have allowed this smut and this sin and this slime to pour over our culture without even putting up a fight, hardly. Sensuality whispers at you. Indulge. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. So then, first, so then, 1 Peter 4, 1 through 11. So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourself with the same attitude he had. Be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. Verse 3. You've had enough in the past of your evil things that, that godless people enjoy. Their immorality, their lust, their feasting, their drunkenness, their wild parties, their t- terrible worship of idols. Of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do. So they slander you. But remember, they will have to face God who stands ready to judge everyone, both the living and the dead. That is why the good news was preached to those who are now dead. So although they were destined to die like all people, they now live forever with God. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sin. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself is speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. The gospel is not a one and done thing. You don't get saved by checking off a box and saying, I've said a prayer and I'm done now. That's it. It's a part of my life that's gone. The gospel makes claims on our life. The gospel says if you are going to be redeemed, then you have to live a life of a redeemed person. It isn't contingent upon your redemption. It is based upon your redemption that you live the life of a redeemed person. He begins in this by saying you better be ready to suffer pain. Hallelujah, praise God. I wish he left that part out. None of us want to suffer. None of us want to suffer, but yet here he's saying, get ready, arm yourself for that, because it's going to happen. If Jesus suffered in the flesh, then you and I ought to be ready to suffer in the flesh also, is what Peter is saying. He should understand he suffered in the flesh. He knew what it was all about. They beat him up one time, and he left rejoicing, thanking God that he was counted worthy to get beat up. When was the last time you counted it worthy for somebody to say something nasty about you because you're a Christian? When is the last time you counted it worthy to stand up for something that God says is important only to have the rest of the people around you criticize you for it, that you went home and said, man, praise God, I was, I was counted worthy to get ragged on because of that stand. That's the mentality that God is calling us to. Doing the right thing, standing for the right things, and no matter what people say, we do it, and then we go away from it saying, man, 
I sure am blessed because they said evil things about me because I'm a Christian. No, we don't think that way. The universality, the reality of suffering is you're going to do it. The universality of it is that everybody is going to suffer. Paul said, all that live godly in this present wicked age shall suffer persecution. Get ready. It hasn't happened yet, but it will. And maybe it has in your life. We complain about how hard our lives are. We've discussed this before. Some of us uh, discussed this, that if you make $35,000 a year, I think it is, thirty or $35,000, you are in the world's 1%. Get a grip on that. You're in 1% of the world's population. So if you make a lot more than 30% or $30,000, just think of where you are in relation to the rest of the world. You and I are so blessed to be where we're at, living where we're at, having the... I, I drove to church this morning. I saw now higher and now higher. I'm convinced at age of 72 that if I wanted to, I could go out tomorrow and find three jobs. People are hiring everywhere. We have a great opportunity in this country to make money. And we complain about our lives. We are living in relative peace and security. I know it's awful to hear the rancor that's going on out there, but I'm telling you, that's 10% of the people. That's not all of us. That's 10% of the people making all that noise. What a great blessing we have. And we talk... We, we, we get grumbly because our lives are so hard. None of us have had to struggle for our life because of our cause of Christ in this room. There's a benefit to suffering found in verse number 3. It can make you holy. There's one thing you can be assured of. When the church is being persecuted, there's no phonies in the church. There used to be this, this illustration of... Uh, back in the Iron, uh, Iron Curtain countries where it was illegal to meet like it is in China today. To, you, unless you're in a sanctioned church that they evaluate, you, you, you weren't supposed to be meeting and doing the things that we're doing freely here. And, and a, guy, a guard comes in with a machine gun and he says, all right, you've got 10 seconds. Anybody who wants to give up their faith and leave, you'll survive. The rest of you are going to die right here. People knelt before the seats that they were in and began to pray, and some of them filtered out. And after it was all over and the people had left, the guard put his machine gun in the corner, and he says, I wanted to worship with you, but I wanted to make sure I was worshiping with real Christians, not phonies. When the time of testing comes, I wonder how full the churches are going to be. Living the gospel means that we are to live differently today. I love that verse 3 where it said, you've had enough of that, haven't you? Haven't you had enough of that? I want you to know that... Listen, I'm, I'm trying to do this in a way that's not all about me and it's really all about God and I, I'm not trying to be but there are many people in this room who have spent too much of their lives diving into the wickedness of this world and if you were to ask them today because God has redeemed them and brought them out of that they would say I've had enough of that I've had enough of that I don't drink not because I think it's wrong to have a beer I don't drink because I had enough of that. I had enough of that. I know where it leads. I know what happens. I just had enough. And I think every born again believer should just say to themselves, I had enough of my past life. I want a different life. See, Christianity doesn't offer a pathway to heaven. Christianity offers a brand new life to live right now. We get a pathway to heaven, but haven't you had enough of this, he says? The 
past evil things that godless people enjoy, their immorality, their lust, their feasting, that's orgies, their drunkenness, their wild parties, their, their terrible worship of idols. Haven't you had enough of that? Our country is being consumed by wickedness. I will know this, that it will result, result in you being derided for your stand. People are going to make fun of you. There's no doubt about that. They will slander you is another word. The word slander is always used when people speak evil of other people. <clears throat> the word blasphemy is used. The same word, by the way, but it's translated blasphemy when you speak evil of God. So people speak evil of God, they commit blasphemy. When they speak evil of other people, it's called slander. We have laws against slander in our country. When you are slandered, uh, by a regular person, you can, you can file a suit. And if you want to, take the person to court and charge them with slander of destroying your good name. They will deride you. They will make fun of you. They will say, how come you don't join us? How come you don't want to come? When your fellow workers are going out and getting blasted after work on Friday night, why don't you come with us? When they're sitting around talking about filthy things that they want to do to other people, you it's, come on, join in with us. No, I don't want to do that. I've had enough of that in my life. I, I, I want to do something else. That's what God is calling us to do. I'm going to tell you why that happens. They're afraid. Every person who lives a godly life in front of people who are living by their passions is a witness to the fact that they're doing wrong. Why is it that everybody who's engaged in some kind of wickedness wants everybody to say it's okay? Because there's an internal thing in the heart of human beings that is telling them it's wrong. It's wrong. Living uh, the gospel will change your direction. You'll walk differently. You'll walk in a different path. I, I think the, the biggest missing part of the gospel today is the change of direction. We say we believe in Jesus Christ, but we don't want to live for Jesus Christ. We say we love Jesus Christ, but we don't want to live for Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 13, 13, let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies, drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling or jealousy. Changes our goals. Ephesians 5, 3, but sexual immor immorality and all impurity and covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper for the saints. I'm here to tell you that if the statistics are true, there are far too many people in this room who are looking at pornography. And it needs to stop. It just needs to stop. I want you to know that pornography is addictive just like alcohol is addictive and just like drugs are addictive. And if you can't stop it, then you need to get help. And we can help you find somebody who will help you Stop it, because it needs to stop. It destroys families, it destroys love, it destroys everything. You've got to not do it. Gospel living requires that we are serving God with our lives. Look at the end of my text, verses 10 and 11. He requires us using our God-given gifts for the benefit of the body, body health. God has given each of us gifts to serve with him. And we serve with them. And we are to use those gifts for the benefit of the body. So if you're a good teacher, you need to teach. If you don't have the gift of teaching, save us, don't teach. <laughs> Nobody should make the Bible boring. The Bible is anything but boring. If you have the ministry of helps, which we have a lot of people in our church who have that ministry, I'm telling you, they were around here yesterday helping a lot. I don't know how many of you weren't here yesterday, but we had to put up chairs. We had so many people in this room, we had to put up chairs in the back for Donna's service. And there were people who were working 
feverishly all through that service to make it a good representation of how we felt about Donna Lancaster. Serving others, caring about others. And I'm telling you right now, some of you have the, the gift of helps. And I'm a, Ernie's going to need some help. And Jeff's going to need some help. There, and Sherry's going to need some help. She has a church that's surrounding her. Jeff lives right up here in Frisco. You know him. You ought to contact him and share with him. Listen, I know you're hurting right now, but I want you to know I love you. And Ernie... Uh, needs hit the men in this church who, who are friends with him to contact him and tell him, listen, I know you've got a big hole in your heart. They were, they were together since they were in junior high. Married 55 years, known each other for 62 years or something like that. You take that out of somebody's life, it's a massive hole in their heart. And many of you in this room know that personally. They're not the only ones that are grieving. We've had enough funerals. I've had enough with that. I've had enough with death. I can't wait until God comes and says death no more. If you're living differently in your life, then you will be serving others. Because God has invested in you the ability to do that. That's what Peter is saying. God's given you a special ability to serve others. Serve them. And the result will be that the body is built up. But the whole thing is summed up like this. It resounds to the glory of the God who redeemed us. Remember in Matthew, Jesus is given the, uh, the, the upper, I mean the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify God who is in heaven. God is from the time he chose a nation of people to represent him from that time all the way through to now, God's purpose has been for his people to live in a way that would direct people to the glory of God. That's why it's there. That's why we have salvation. In the first, why, otherwise, we'd just be redeemed and go on to heaven. He wants us to live in a certain way so that people who are outside of the faith can look at us and say, that's how God is. That's how God live, loves. This is how God lives. I want to know that God. They can bring glory to God. I end with my conclusion. It's very simple. God, the gospel puts claims on your life. I don't have to come with a bucket full of money, and I don't have to come with some kind of anything to earn my favor with God. You can't. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're out from day one. Somebody says, what do I have to do to go to hell? And I say, absolutely nothing. You're already going there. Without Jesus Christ, the only destination you will have is hell, period. That's in your face, I know, that's, that's harsh, but it's true. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. And the gift of God is eternal life. So you don't have to do anything. You just set and spend your life the way you want to spend it. And when it ends, you will see that I am true. That I am saying what Jesus Christ says. What the word of God says. The gospel comes into our lives by the grace of God. And it puts claims on us. I am bought with the price. Therefore, I should glorify God with my whole being because I am not my own. I belong to God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but sexual immorality a, a sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Make your choices based upon what God says, not how you feel. And recognize the voice when it whispers in your ear. In our little video, uh, Brandon put together, you know, fulfill a certain desire in an ungodly way. That's sin. Fulfilling a desire, a, a God-given desire in a, a non-God-sanctioned way. 
That's what's wrong with sex outside of the way God designed it to be. But the, the sensuality that I feel this will be good for me, I feel, I feel, I feel, you cannot trust your feelings. They will lie to you. Trust your heart is what we are told today. Trust your heart. The Bible says the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? You can't trust your heart and you can't trust your feelings, but you can trust this book because it is true. Make your choices based upon that. In this message, for sure, I've quoted from Corinthians, Colossians, Ephesians, Romans, and Galatians, all saying exactly the same thing. I got to think that's important. Father, I do thank you today for the truth of the word of God. I know how difficult it is in a society, in a culture that is given over to sexual immorality to try to live a life governed by truth instead of emotion. Help us to do that. There are people in this room who need to be freed from sin. They're held captive by it. And they think there's no way out. But there is a way out. It's through Jesus Christ. I pray for them. And I pray for all of us who, who are just struggling away to try to live a righteous life in an unrighteous world. That we would get bold. That we would take to heart what David said. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So that we might be victorious in the way we live. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There is no temptation that has taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, not willing you to suffer above that which you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to be victorious over it. God understands that temptation is real. And he gives us a way of escape. And often the way of escape is through the word of the living God. A word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The next time the voice whispers, click on that. Say, God, no temptation is taken. I, there's no temptation that's taken me that you can't escape me from. I'm going to trust you. Whatever it is, let's stand to sing our invitational song.